Picture this. It's May 1945, and you're standing on the flight deck of the USS Enterprise in the Pacific. The Airbus has just launched 30 Hellcats and Dauntless dive bombers for a strike on Japanese positions. They'll be back in two hours, low on fuel, some shot up. Pilots exhausted, and here's the problem that's about to kill some of them. Your flight deck is an 872-foot-long parking lot, with exactly one way in and one way out. Every carrier in World War II operated like a deadly game of musical chairs. When planes returned from missions, they had to land one at a time on the stern, catch an arresting wire, then immediately taxi forward to park near the bow. Sounds simple, right? Except each landing took about 90 seconds, and you had 30 planes circling overhead with maybe 20 minutes of fuel left. Do the math. That's 45 minutes of recovery. It's time for 30 aircraft. The last planes in the pattern were landing on fumes, and if one pilot missed the wires and crashed, everything stopped. The deck crew had to push the wreckage overboard while 29 other pilots burned precious fuel in circles, watching their gauges drop toward empty. But the real nightmare wasn't the recovery time. It was what happened after. Once all your planes were back aboard, they sat parked wingtip to wingtip, fully armed and fueled. The flight deck looked like a crowded parking garage filled with bombs and aviation gas. Want to launch another strike? You couldn't. Not until deck crews manhandled every single aircraft, respotting them for launch. Which took another hour, for 60 to 90 minutes after recovery. Your carrier was completely useless. Admiral Mark Mitcher, commanding Task Force 58 in 1944, called this the deck cycle problem and it was strangling American naval air power. His carriers could theoretically operate a hundred aircraft each, but the straight deck geometry meant only one major strike per day. The Japanese had the same problem. At Midway in June 1942, carriers Akagi Kaga and Soryu were caught with planes parked everywhere, unable to launch or land when American dive bombers arrived. They went down because their decks were frozen trapped in the recovery respatry arm cycle. Carriers were supposed to replace battleships as the backbone of naval power. But battleships could fire continuously, a carrier launching one strike every six hours. That wasn't a weapon. That was an expensive sitting duck. The U.S. Navy calculated that, in a battle against the Soviet Navy in the late 1940s, carriers might only get one strike before enemy submarines and ships closed range. One punch than a knife fight with an empty gun. The straight deck design wasn't anyone's fault. It was simply how everyone had built carriers since the 1920s, a long, clear runway pointing into the wind. Nobody questioned it, until pilots started dying not from enemy fire, but from fuel starvation, waiting to land on their own ships. December 7, 1941, changed everything about how navies thought about carrier warfare, not in the way most people remember. Yes. Pearl Harbor proved that carriers could project devastating power. Japanese strike. Aircraft crippled the U.S. Pacific Fleet in two hours. But what happened after the attack revealed the fatal weakness? Admiral Nagumo's six carriers launched 353. Aircraft in two waves. By 10 a.m., when the last planes returned, his decks were so clogged that he couldn't launch a third strike. It would have taken three hours to clear. Rearm and respite. Time he didn't have. So Nagumo turned for home, leaving the job half finished. His flight decks had become parking lots. The Americans learned that same lesson the hard way six months later at Midway. June 4, 1942, Japanese carriers were caught in the worst possible moment. Akagi. Kaga and Soryu were paralyzed for 47 minutes, some planes being armed for land strike. Others refueled for naval attack. Then Wade McCluskey's dive bombers from Enterprise arrived. Three carriers destroyed in five minutes because they physically couldn't get planes airborne. The straight deck design had turned them into floating bombs. After Midway, both navies started tracking deck cycle efficiency. How long a carrier was useless between strikes? The numbers were brutal. USS Yorktown averaged 93 minutes between last recovery and next launch. USS Saratoga, 108 minutes. Japanese Shikaku, 2 hours and 14 minutes. 
Carriers were spending more time shuffling aircraft than fighting. Wade. McCluskey, later wrote a memo. We're built for one-punch fights. But we're in a 15-round boxing match. It was right. Whichever side launched first, usually won. The other was trapped in recovery carrier battles had devolved into quick-draw duels. By mid-1943, the U.S. Navy had enough Essex-class carriers to rotate, one launching, one recovering, one rearming. It worked barely. But it meant three ships to do the job of one. Commander Joseph Clifton, serving on Lexington in 1944, recorded that during the Battle of the Philippine Sea. American carriers launched 226 aircraft but took 97 minutes to recover them all. Five pilots ditched from fuel exhaustion. Waiting for deck space. The system was unsustainable. A new idea was needed. While the Americans fought in the Pacific, the Royal Navy quietly started solving the problem. Captain Matthew Slattery on HMS. Lustrious began experimenting in 1943. What if planes could land while others were still parked forward? He painted a white line down the port side of the deck, creating a narrow landing strip. It worked once before a sea fire clipped a parked plane's tail. Still, it proved a point. Maybe you didn't need the full width of the deck to land. Then came Dennis Campbell, a physicist. He thought of carrier decks like railway junctions, not highways. Angled the landing area five to port, he proposed. And planes could land while others launched forward. HMS Triumph. Tested the idea in 1944. It worked, sort of. Two operations at once. But the five angle wasn't enough to truly separate the two zones. The war ended before they perfected it. The data sat forgotten. Enter Commander Walter Wally Boone, U.S. Navy test pilot, 1951. Jet aircraft were heavier, faster, and needed longer decks. Experts said carriers were obsolete. Boone disagreed. He'd read the British reports and saw the flaw. Five wasn't enough. He proposed an eight to ten angle, allowing a missed landing bolter to just power up and take off safely. Admiral Apollo Sosik told him, prove it. So Boone grabbed the USS Midway, painted an angled landing area eight off to port, and repositioned the arresting gear. July 1951, the first test. Boone came in at 145 knots, trapped perfectly on the angled deck, while another plane launched from the bow, simultaneously, launch, recover, launch, recover, 12 landings and 12, launches in 18 minutes on a straight deck. That would have taken an hour, when Boone deliberately missed the wires. He boltered, lifted off clean, and came around again. No crash. No fuel loss. No panic. The angled deck worked. Proving it with paint was one thing. Making it real was another. The retrofit required redesigning the entire carrier architecture. The island had to move aft and shrink to clear the new approach path. The arresting gear had to be rebuilt at an angle. The catapults were upgraded to new steam systems, more powerful than ever. Even the mirror landing system had to be recalibrated. Each retrofit cost $8 to $12 million and took six to nine months. By 1955, 13 Essex-class carriers had been converted. USS Antietam became the first operational angled deck carrier. She was about to prove it in combat. January 1953, Antietam arrived off Korea. Commander William Sesko, the air boss, kept detailed logs. In 12 hours, Antietam launched and recovered 68 sorties. Her straight-deck sister ship, Kearsarge, managed three nine same planes. Same missions. 74% more combat power. Deck availability jumped from 42% to 79%, meaning pilots could finally count on having a place to land, and it saved lives. A Sky Raider boltered with a live bomb, safe on the angled deck. A Panther came in hot, missed wires, climbed away, tried again. A disoriented pilot landed way off center, still trapped safely, by March 1953. Antietam was flying 89 sorties per day versus 47 on straight decks. Admiral reports were clear. Every carrier not modified is fighting at half capacity. The debate was over. 
The Navy didn't just retrofit, they started over by 1954. They designed the Forrestal-class supercarriers built from the keel up around the angled deck. For steam catapults, reinforced deck plating. Aft Island, the result. Continuous operations. During tests, USS Forrestal launched a 40-plane strike, recovered 32 aircraft, and launched another. 20-plane patrol, all in 47 minutes, she could fly 170 sorties per day. Almost double any World War II carrier. The Soviets took notice. Admiral Gorshkov wrote in 1956, NATO, carriers built around the angled deck can maintain continuous strike capability. The Soviet Navy has no effective counter. The U.S. had achieved rolling thunder capability, nonstop air power. By 1959, four Forrestal-class carriers, Forrestal Saratoga Ranger, Independents were operational. Each equaled the power of three World War II carriers combined, even in 2025. The geometry remains unchanged. The eight angle, the catapults, the optical landing system, all identical in concept to Boone's. 1951 paint test, the USS Gerald R. Ford, commissioned in 2017, costs $13 billion and includes futuristic tech butter deck. Same eight. During Operation Inherent Resolve 2016, USS Eisenhower flew 12,000 combat sorties in seven months without a single recovery delay. The angled deck removed an entire category of fear from naval aviation, 